Operation Duck Tang 1 began at 0630, January 2nd, 1963. The Arvind 7th Division, with its American advisors, was to destroy a Viet Cong radio in Aptan Toy and the company that defended it. The plan was to assault the hamlet with the 1,200 men of the division using helicopter transports escorted by armed helicopters and armoured personnel carriers. Support was to be provided by 4.2 inch mortars, 105mm and 155mm howitzers and close air support. But unlike previous engagements when they would initiate and then break contact, this time the PLAF, numbering around 340 guerrillas, would stand and fight, and the battle that followed would become a defining moment in the growing conflict. Before dawn on the morning of the 2nd of January 1963, South Vietnamese soldiers from the 352nd Ranger Company disembarked from the 14 landing craft that had carried them from Mi Tho. Two and a half hours later, at 0630, Lieutenant Colonel John Van took off in an L-19, a two-seat observation aircraft, also known as a bird dog. Van had enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps in 1943, but had not seen active service until the Korean War, where he served first with the 25th Infantry Division in the Pusan Perimeter, later leading a ranger company. Van had been assigned to South Vietnam in 1962 as an advisor to the commander of Arvind 4 Corps, which oversaw the Mekong Delta region, and was the senior advisor to the 7th Division, based in Mito. He was to supervise the landing of the 2nd Battalion, 11th Infantry, south of the Rangers. The battalion was being lifted in free serials by the 93rd Transportation Company from a small dirt strip at Tan Heap. The 93rd Transportation Company had departed from Rhode Island in December 1961, arriving at Da Nang on January 25th, and was equipped with 10 H-21 helicopters. The Piaseki H-21 Shawnee, commonly known as the Flying Banana, was a tandem rotor multi-mission helicopter. It was relatively slow, and its unprotected control cables and fuel lines proved vulnerable to automatic small arms and heavy anti-aircraft machine guns. Although the Shawnee could carry 20 passengers, it carried 9 when operating in Vietnam. Also at 0630, the Din Tong Regiment crossed its line of departure. The regiment comprised the 17th Civil Guard Battalion, its six companies distributed between Task Force A and Task Force B, and the 4th Mechanized Rifle Squadron, 2nd Armoured Cavalry Regiment. Civil Guard units were lightly armed and organised into 160-man companies. Divided into four platoons and a headquarters section, their primary role was to conduct counter-insurgency operations, collect intelligence information, and participate in civic action programmes. The 17th CG Battalion advanced from the south of Outback, Back, Task Force A to the east, and Task Force B to the west. Previously designated the 7th Mechanised Company, the 4-2 ACR had been organised in April 1962, completing its nine-week training programme in June. Although it had been relatively successful in combat operations in the summer and autumn, its performance indicated a requirement for additional training. 4-2 ACR advanced west of Outback in 13 M113 APCs, two fewer than its authorised TOE. The M113 is a fully tracked armoured personnel carrier, first fielded in Vietnam in 1962. The 113 has a crew of two and can carry 11 passengers, entering the vehicle through a rear entry ramp. In Vietnam, its most common armament was a single .50 caliber M2 machine gun mounted over the commander's hatch. Aluminium armour protects the crew and passengers against small arms fire and artillery shell splinters. The first serial of 211 landed at 0700, the 10 H-21s escorted by five UH-1Bs from the Utility Tactical Transport Helicopter Company. 
The UTT was activated in July 1962 in Okinawa and was sent to Thailand for a 90 day period. It then went on to South Vietnam and in November Major Ivan Slavich assumed command of the unit, at which time the unit began to receive UH-1Bs armed with the XM-6 flex gun system. Throughout 1963 the UTT was used to prove the concept of the armed helicopter. The 211 advisor, Captain Kenneth Good, established communications with Van and reported no enemy contact. The helicopters returned to Tanheap to pick up the second serial, but could not lift off safely due to a dense ground fog, and with the remainder of the 211 waiting for conditions to improve at Tanheap, Captain Good and the forward element advanced south towards Aptan Toy. The Rangers received orders to move south to reinforce 211. However, after losing one man to a mine, the Rangers stopped after moving 500 metres and would later be ordered to return to guard the 11th Regiment's command post at Mito without influencing the course of the battle. At 0742, Task Force A came under fire from the east-west tree line south of that back. The CG units were caught crossing a rice paddy and were quickly pinned down. This was the southernmost element of the 1st Company, 261st Regional Battalion of the PLAF. Two other elements completed a semicircle around the hamlet to the north and east, oriented to the southwest and west respectively. Van's aircraft refuelled at 0900, and as it took off, the second serial of 211 left Tanheap for the landing zone, which Van had moved south 750 metres as the forward elements of 211 advanced. By 0935, the last serial had landed. The battalion then received fire from the tree line to the west. This was an element from the 1st Company, 514th Provincial Battalion. C1514 was oriented to the southwest, with its right flank anchored in Aptan Toy. 211 closed with the contact and seized a French rifle, two grenades, and two prisoners, before continuing its advance to the south. At 0945, the division command post received its first report on Task Force A. Task Force A had been in contact since 0742, and after closing to within 30 metres of C1261's dug-in position, it had withdrawn after exchanging fire for 15 minutes. Between 0800 and 0945 it had assaulted the position twice, but had been driven back with casualties. To break the stalemate, the decision was made to insert the reserve. Van circled the two possible landing zones for 10 minutes. He rejected the area east of that back as too small and, unable to detect PLAF in the area, he decided to insert the reserve to the west of that back, 300 metres from the tree line. By 1000 hours the situation had become critical for Task Force A. The Task Force commander had been killed and one of the company commanders had been wounded. Major Lam Kwang To, the Din Tung Regiment Commander, ordered his CG units into static blocking positions and requested that the reserve be committed to relieve the pressure. Task Force A remained exposed in the rice paddy, with Task Force B unable to help. To ordered the 17th Battalion Commander forward to assume command of Task Force A. However, this replacement was not accomplished in the six hours after he arrived in the field, and until he assumed command, Toh refused to talk to Task Force A. As the H-21s touched down with 1st Company, 1st Battalion, 11th Infantry, several pilots reported that they were taking fire. The helicopters had landed 200 metres from the tree line, directly in front of C-1-261's defensive positions. The UH-1Bs fired into the eastern and southern tree lines without noticeable effect. Though hit by ground fire, the first four H-21s lifted off, but the fifth helicopter had received heavy ground fire and remained on the landing zone. The sixth circled in an attempt to rescue the crew, but was forced down between the downed helicopter and the tree line, and could not lift off again. The remainder of the flight departed for Tan Heap, although one made a forced landing due to the damage from ground fire it had received. 
The five UH-1Bs continued to circle the landing zone firing suppression. One left the formation as it approached for another pass and attempted to land to the west of the two Shawnees, but losing its tail rotor to ground fire, it turned on its right side and crashed. The M113s of 42 ACR were behind the North South Canal to the west of that back. Van requested that it cross the canal to assist 1111 and secure the two H21s and the UH 1B on the landing zone. However, the commander of 42 ACR, Captain Lee Tong Ba, refused to deploy his company. Van attempted to expedite the move of the M113s and told the two advisers with 42 ACR. Captain James Scanlon and Captain Robert Mays, that the division commander, Colonel Dam, had ordered Barr to proceed to at back. But Barr did not respond to this directive for almost an hour. While Task Force A and the division reserve were pinned down and taking casualties, Major Two kept Task Force B and 42 ACR in static positions, unable to provide help. Meanwhile, Van had observed artillery rounds falling wide of the probable PLAF positions in and around at back. When the division command post informed him that an Orvin L-19 was observing and adjusting the rounds, he went south to observe the CG units. Task Force A no longer appeared to be in contact, while Task Force B had moved 800 metres to the north, short of the tree line south of at back. Shortly after 1100 hours, it was reported to Van that two seriously injured helicopter crewmen were on the landing zone. Sergeant First Class Arnold Bowers had landed with the reserve. He had removed the crew chief, Sergeant William Deal, from the downed UH-1B, before realising that he was dead. He then went to the second downed helicopter nearest the tree line and found Specialist Fourth Class Donald Brumman inside. He had been wounded in the shoulder and Bowers advised him to wait there for medical evacuation. At 11.30, 42 ACR began to cross the canal, while artillery and close air support pounded at back. One hour after returning to Tanheap, information was received that ground fire at the landing zone had subsided, allowing evacuation of the helicopter crews. One of only two flyable H-21s landed despite damage received from sporadic ground fire but enemy fire increased when loading was attempted, wounding the pilot and forcing the helicopter to lift off. The damaged H-21 then made a forced landing in the middle of Barr's company. Its crew was recovered by the second H-21, which then returned to Tan Heap, escorted by three UH-1Bs, which had provided suppression during the evacuation attempt. Two of the damaged helicopters had been repaired from parts taken from other damaged H-21s, and for the remainder of the afternoon were used to resupply ammunition and conduct medical evacuations into the first three landing zones. Shortly after 1200 hours, the Auburn units had started to move toward at back. 211, advancing from the north, converged on Aptan Toy from three directions. C514 waited until 211 had closed within 20 metres of their positions before opening fire surprising the Arvin soldiers. 211 assaulted C1514 three times during the following five hours without success, before it lost momentum and waited for artillery and close support to deal with the PLAF. 42 ACR continued to make slow progress towards the landing zone. Some of the M113s had now turned east towards at back, and the company had also tied in with the left flank of Task Force B which was closing with elements of C1261 in the tree line south of the hamlet. When elements of the C1261 platoon in front of Task Force A began to withdraw, the PLAF battalion commander ordered them to return to their positions. The commander of Task Force B, recognising the opportunity to flank the PLAF, requested permission to attack four times, but so refused. The M113s continued forward, without the CG soldiers, and without clearing the tree line on their southern flank. Shortly before 1400 hours, elements of 42 ACR began their assault towards the landing zone, and the tree line on the far side of at back. At 1350, 
The two lead M113s were engaged from an unidentified machine gun position 50 metres away, returning ineffective fire. Sergeant Bowers jumped from one of the carriers and ran to the second downed H21. Inside he found Brahman dead. The M113 crews began to take casualties from PLAF fire. The commanders lacked upper body protection while manning the .50 caliber machine guns and the drivers often elevated their seats to improve observation rather than use the equipped periscopes which made them vulnerable to small arms fire. The M113s, unable to identify and suppress the PLF positions, withstood the fire for a time before withdrawing, leaving 1111 and their wounded on the landing zone. With all of the M113s now across the canal, 4-2 ACR attacked the tree line, but unable to mass the carriers for an organised assault, the APCs advanced in small groups. Two approached too close to the tree line without infantry support and were engaged by two PLAF soldiers that had left their positions. One fired a rifle grenade, while the second tossed a hand grenade, knocking out both M113s. Taking further casualties, 4-2 ACR withdrew behind the damaged helicopters, leaving ineffective artillery rounds and close air support to continue to fall around at back. Van realised that 7th Division was unlikely to close on at back before nightfall. He recommended to Colonel Dam that 8th Airborne Battalion be dropped east of at back, reasoning that the Arvon could hold the PLAF in position until the morning. Dam informed him that the battalion would instead be dropped west of at back, to facilitate a link-up with the Arvon forces there. Van returned to the division command post at Tan Heap and found Colonel Dam with his superior, General Hein van Kau, 4 Corps commander and former commander of 7th Division. In October 1962, after a disastrous air assault near At Mai Long, 40 miles south of Saigon, in which a Ranger platoon had been effectively decimated, Kau had been summoned to Saigon and reprimanded by President Diem. Warned that further heavy losses would prevent further promotion, he had become reluctant to aggressively engage and destroy PLEF units. The decision to drop the paratroops to the west of Atback left an escape route open for the PLAF. Half an hour later, Van was informed that the senior advisor of 211, Captain Good, had been seriously wounded near Aptan Toy. At 15.25, a medivac arrived at Tan Heap with Good and six Arvon wounded. Good became the third American to die at our back. In the late afternoon, as artillery and airstrikes continued to target our back and our Tantoy, the Arvon units were content to maintain their positions and await 8AB. With dusk approaching, seven C-123 transport aircraft appeared, dropping the paratroops between our Tantoy and our back. 8AB was split into two elements with those dropped in the north engaged in the air and on the ground by C-1514, while those in the south dropped without incident. The PLAF battalion commander realised that his position was untenable. His men were tired, hungry and short of ammunition, and after consulting with the commander of C-1514, he ordered his units to move to Aptan Toy, from where they would withdraw to the east. A flare ship was on station over at back, but as 8AB's commander had requested that flares not be used, only harassment and interdiction fires were used against the hamlet. The PLAF withdrawal began at 2200 hours, withdrawing by platoon in the darkness, with 2nd platoon, C1154, the last to leave Aptan Toy. At noon the next day, Arvon units entered at back unopposed, ending the battle. The American advisers, including Van and Colonel Porter, senior advisor to Four Corps, believed that the battle had been a failure for the Arvon. Van described it as a miserable damn performance. However, General Paul Hawkins, commander of United States Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, and his superior, Admiral Harry Felt, Commander-in-Chief Pacific, regarded the battle as an Arvon victory. This attitude encouraged a growing distrust with the media, which was becoming increasingly sceptical about developments in Vietnam. 
Hawkins forwarded his comprehensive plan for South Vietnam to Sinkpak in late January 1963. His assumption was that the insurgency would be under control before the end of 1965. Two weeks after the battle, in his State of the Union address, President Kennedy declared that the spear point of aggression has been blunted in South Vietnam. But as the PLAF withdrew from at back, it also believed itself the victor. It drew strength not only from the significant losses it had inflicted on the Arvon, but also from the success of its new anti-helicopter tactics. The victory at Outback, it believed, would encourage its people to more victories and ultimately final victory. <laughs>